How would you like to know about the uh, six key practices to integrate into your daily life that will unshackle limiting beliefs, and make you feel more confident, and unlock your potential in all areas of your life? If you're going through life with low self-esteem, then you are at a severe disadvantage, and your low self-esteem is going to manifest itself in all areas of your life. Nathaniel Brandon is the thought leader on this subject. He has basically dedicated most of his life, unfortunately he's dead now, he died in 2014 from Parkinson's disease, he dedicated decades and decades to studying how to cultivate high self-esteem in individuals and his most key work on that is the book I'm reviewing now and it's called The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. So how does low self-esteem manifest itself? Let me give you some practical examples. Um, if you're in a relationship, you have low self-esteem, you might feel like your partner is better than you, you might feel like you're lucky to have that person and that um, if you ever lost that person then you would never quite recover or never be able to find someone else quite as good. You might feel like your partner is just on a love, another level to you and ultimately you might even sabotage the relationship because of this lack of self-worth, self-esteem that you have. In the workplace, maybe you're in a meeting with your colleagues and you have an idea that you want to share with everybody but you don't actually speak up about your idea. You keep it inside because you feel like your idea will be rubbish, you feel like your colleagues won't take you seriously or that your idea doesn't really have any meaning or any substance to it. He just talks about um, success and low self-esteem. You know, success can actually still come from people who have low self-esteem, and here's how it might arise. If somebody has low self-esteem, they may try and solve this problem by accumulating wealth or external things like uh, financial success or business success. They may try, they may kind of turn their entire motivations to achieving these things to try and feel better about themselves and try and increase their self-esteem. Interestingly, uh, the author says that when this happens, usually that person will attain what they've been trying to strive for, let's say um, financial success, but they will feel like an imposter once they've got their rewards. They feel like they don't really deserve it. They feel like they've got more than they, uh, they should have. They, they feel guilty um, and they feel like they're going to be exposed for the fraud that they are. They're going to be exposed somebody doesn't really deserve the success that they've been having and then it's all going to be taken away from them. So that's what it's like to be successful by modern day terms, I guess, uh, and still have low self-esteem and that success doesn't bring high self-esteem. Nathaniel Brandon says in his book that while your childhood and your upbringing does contribute, it can help cultivate high self-esteem in individuals, it's also not necessary and it's also not a very always a very reliable indicator and he cites an example um, which he calls the Invincibles, uh, which is a group of children who had pretty pretty bad trauma during their upbringing, who then went on to create happy, successful, and high self-esteem within themselves. So, a tragedy of self-esteem is this, and this is how Nathaniel Brenner described it. The tragedy of self-esteem is that most people who have low self-esteem look to external resources to try and feel better about themselves, to try and generate higher self-esteem. What does that mean? It means that most people try and get external wealth or try and buy things or try and achieve success, recognition, this kind of stuff in order to improve their self-esteem. And that paradoxically, this actually doesn't work. And in many, um, in many times, it can actually make you feel worse about yourself because you finally achieve what you wanted, uh, but you still don't feel good. And it kind of sends you into a tailspin. He says that if you want to achieve high self-esteem, you want to cultivate that, it's got to come from within. And the way you cultivate high self-esteem within is by integrating six key practices into your life. And these are the six pillars that he covers in his book. And these are the pillars that I'm going to run through right now. So let's very quickly run over what self-esteem is and what it looks like. So high self, uh, self-esteem can be broken down into two key areas. The first is self-efficacy, which is basically your basic confidence in life challenges. If you're, if you're a person with high self-efficacy, then you're just confident that no matter what life throws at you, you're going to be able to handle it. It's just you're going to be able to take on whatever challenge comes your way, and you're just confident in your ability to do that, even though you don't yet know how to achieve that. The other part of high self-esteem is self-respect, and this is all about being worthy of happiness. So if you achieve success, you achieve wealth, or you achieve recognition, it's, it's the knowledge that you know you are worth that. You don't feel guilty about it. And it's also about your personal integrity and living true to your values. This 
this is all self-respect. This all comes into self-respect. He says that if you have high self-esteem, you have high self-efficacy and high self-respect. A great definition of self-esteem is this. To have high self-esteem is to feel confidently appropriate to life. So what does that mean? It means you have an idea of where you are in reality, have a, a very good real idea. It's not warped perceptions that you have in your head and you react in an appropriate way to that reality. So you're not projecting yourself as something or somebody that you're not. You're not, um, you know, the stereotypical kind of cocky, arrogant, um, big-headed guy. Um, you're not that person. You're presenting yourself in a way that's appropriate to where you are in reality. He also says that if you have high self-esteem, you are not hiding from yourselves and you're not at war with who you are. And I'm going to cover a bit more about this later on, but this is all about being, you have your values and you stick to them. You don't um, gloss over problems that you have, you accept that they exist and you work on improving them. So let's go through these pillars that he talks about in this book. How do you actually cultivate high self-esteem? This is the million dollar question, right? So the first thing he says before we actually talk about each of the pillars, he says this, self-esteem cannot be worked on directly. It's not something that um, it's a direct action to work on your self-esteem, but instead what you need to do is cultivate practices in your life, in your everyday life, and they're going to be really difficult to integrate into your life to begin with, but over time that will get easier. And over time you'll notice that your self-esteem is slowly rising. So the key thing to understand here, if you have low self-esteem and you're watching this video, is it's not a case of just reading this book and then the next day you're going to feel great about yourself. This is something that's going to take a bit of time to get right. So these are the six practices that you need to try and ingrain in your daily life. So the first is the practice of living consciously. So he, he says that living consciously is being um, is making a decision to be conscious and aware of everything that's going on in your life. I like to consider this as just paying attention. Okay, So you're paying attention to the things that you're doing, you're paying attention to the thoughts that you're having, the, the actions that you're taking, the things you feel. These are the, this, is, um, this is what living consciously is all about. It's also called mindfulness in other self-development books that talk about mindfulness. It's just not floating through life without thinking about things that are going on. It's, trying to figure out what's going on around you, trying to see the truth, trying to figure out your, uh, why you're behaving the way you are, what actions you're taking, why you're taking those actions. It's just paying attention to what's going on in your life. And it says, this is the practice of living consciously and this is pillar number one. So let me give you a practical example of what um, living consciously might be. Uh, let's say you have somebody who's going to the gym and they've been going to the gym for a couple of years, they made some good changes to their body, they're looking better, they're feeling happier, and then they start considering the idea of going on steroids. Somebody who's living consciously would then look at that and try and figure out where that's coming from. Um, are you trying to go on steroids because it's good for you? It's a, it's a good decision for yourself, or are you trying to go on steroids to satisfy some kind of external thing? Maybe it's because you want to impress other people, or you, you feel insecure and around other guys, and you want to try and be bigger, and you think that's going to um, ease your concerns that you have. This is the kind of stuff you need to look at if you're living consciously. You need to try and take it another level lower and see why you want to do the things that you, you're planning on doing. Well, why are you thinking of going on steroids? Is it try to? Is it because you're um, you're lacking self-esteem, is because you're lacking confidence, where is that coming from and is that the right action to take? That's the practice of living consciously. So the author talks about you, how you can start to live more consciously, how you can start to implement this into your life and he gives a journaling exercise which is called sentence then completions. I won't go into too much about this exercise, it's described really well in the book, but essentially he gives you like a sentence stem. So in this case it would be living consciously to me means and then without thinking too much about it you have to end that sentence in a, a number of different ways so you, you would write living consciously to me means and then you end it and then you living consciously to me means and you write another variation of that you just keep writing it on a daily basis and over time that's designed to help you think about living consciously and integrating that into your daily life so number one the practice of living consciously 
Pillar number two is the practice of self-acceptance. So Nathaniel Brandon describes this as the refusal of being in an adversarial relationship with yourself. He says that there are three levels of self-acceptance. So level one is basic self-respect. And this is kind of standing up for your right to exist and treating yourself with basic respect and valuing yourself. The second level of self-acceptance is being true to yourself. So uh, rather than trying to cover over or putting your head in, your, in the sand when you make a mistake or, you, or there's a problem in your life, you actually accept that that problem exists. And level three is compassion and kindness. So if you make a mistake, not only do you accept it that it exists, but you also show compassion towards yourself. And you, he says that there's ways of doing this um, by rationalizing why you made the mistake that you did and saying that it's actually okay. Even the worst crimes that you create in your life, there's usually an underlying reason, um, where, and that's what you can use to be compassionate to yourself. So he says there are two levels of self-acceptance. Uh, sorry, he says there's two fallacies of self-acceptance. These are things, these are um, falses about self-acceptance, what people tend to believe when we talk about self-acceptance that are actually not true. So number one, to accept who we are, we must approve everything about us. Self-acceptance isn't approval. Self-acceptance is acknowledging the existence of something, uh, but it's not actually approving of that thing. So you can accept something exists and then set about trying to fix it and solve it. The second fallacy of self-acceptance is if we accept who we are, then we are indifferent to change or improvement. Again, it's the same thing. If you see there's a problem or an issue in your life, you can accept that it exists and still go about um, finding a plan or coming up with an action plan to improve that problem. It's not about being indifferent or um, resistant to change. It's not about accepting that that's who we are and that's who we'll ever be. It's just accepting the presence of that particular problem at that particular point in time. Here's an interesting point about self-acceptance. If we don't accept the problems and issues in our lives, then they have a tendency to grow bigger and stronger. One of the best ways to actually melt away the issues that you have, the insecurities that you have, or the problems that you have in your life, to you actually just, in the first stage, consciously be conscious and realize that they're there, and then in the second stage, accept that that's the situation that you're in. Once you start to accept that, then you can work about it, then you can work on it, you can set about resolving it. But unless you accept it, you won't be able to fix those problems that you're having. So pillar number two is the practice of self-acceptance. Pillar number three is the practice of self-responsibility. So. This is all about taking responsibility for your life and what you bring about in your life. Somebody who is self-responsible, who goes through a problem, asks questions like, what can I do about it? What avenues of action are possible for me? What did I overlook? What did I miscalculate? What knowledge do I need to fix this? What resources do I need to fix this? How do I get this knowledge and resources, etc.? Somebody who isn't self-responsible would say things like, but no one told me what to do. No one told me this would happen. Uh, you didn't help me solve this, you didn't uh, teach me about the value of saving money when I was younger, so that's why I don't save money now. It's basically the opposite to being a victim. Self, being self-responsible is the opt opposite of victimhood, essentially. And being a victim, um, to describe that, is you're basically at the mercy of everything around you. You're at the mercy of the external circumstances. Other people make changes and inflict things on you, the environment inflicts things on you, and you're helpless in that environment. You're just pushed around like a sailing boat on the ocean. That's victimhood. The practice of self-responsibility self is the opposite to that. It's taking responsibility for your life and the actions that you choose and the results that you get. So there's two other points that the author talks about when he talks about self-responsibility. One, one is the lemming effect. This is another example of low self-responsibility. When you see a crowd of people um, doing a certain thing and making a certain decision, and you just go along with that decision because you see that they've made that decision, essentially. It's called the lemming effect after the computer game, whereby you know a couple of lemmings would walk off a cliff and then all the other lemmings would follow, because which lemmings, that was their character, just follow each other. Living with high self-responsibility means that you critically think for yourself. You don't just 
follow other people's whims, follow other people's opinions and actions because you think that they're the people to follow and that's it, you don't think about it. You're responsible for your actions yourself. Even if you have a crowd of people going over here, be very critical, think critically about the situation and make sure that they are making the right decision before you go and follow them. So that's one example of living with self-responsibility. The second thing to remember here, and this is a phrase that he used quite often in this chapter, no one is coming. Okay, If you have problems, if you have situations, circumstances in your life that you don't like, no one's going to be your savior. No one's going to come down and rescue you from the situation. You have to be your own savior. You have to make sure that you take responsibility to solve the issues that you're having. So that's pillar number three, the practice of self-responsibility. Pillar number four is the practice of self-assertiveness. So this is all about honoring your wants, needs and values and seeking appropriate forms of their expression in reality. The easiest way for me to describe this practice is by giving an example. So let's say you're at a cocktail party and you're with a bunch of friends. Um, one of your friends says, some, says a racial slur or something bad that you really don't like, it's against your value system. Instead of speaking up about it, you decide to keep it within yourself and not say anything. You don't express your assertiveness um, about what was said, about the fact that you're unhappy with it, and you just keep it within. Nathaniel Brandon says every time you do that, your self-esteem takes a hit. Often, to be self-assertive, you have to have courage, especially in this example that I just gave above, you have to have courage to um, speak out in the crowd and get your point across and say, I wasn't happy with this racial slur. That is one of the, the difficulties of being self-assertive, but it's also um, can manifest itself in other areas. So let's say, um, a very simple example, you're, you're on a car journey with all your friends, um, but you really need the toilet. Uh, someone who's self-assertive, is that, that's a need that you have. Someone who's self-assertive is going to express that need, even though it's going to be a minor inconvenience to all your friends. That's a very simple example, but being assertive means making sure that you have the self-respect to get uh, what you need and to make sure that your value system isn't compromised by others, that you just speak up for what you stand for, essentially. So that's pillar number four, the practice of self-responsibility. Pillar number five is the practice of living purposefully. So this is all about formulating goals and putting into action an action plan to make those goals a reality. So um, it's about being a strategic thinker. It's about deciding what you want to happen in your life and then purposefully going after it, living a life of purpose. And this can be in all areas of your life. So if you want a loving relationship, it would be to be aware that you want this loving relationship, formulate what you want exactly in terms of goals, and get the knowledge, get the expertise that you need to make this happen, and follow through on your path. It's kind of like being a strategic thinker. It's the opposite of being somebody who just floats through life without really having any kind of direction. So here's how you live purposely. Step one, formulate your goals and purposes consciously. Step two, identify the actions needed. Step three, monitor behavior to check it's in line with one's goals. And step four, paying attention to outcomes to make sure it's, in, it's going in the right direction. If you're, living, if you're living with the practice of living purposely, then you're asking your questions like, where do I want to be in two years? Where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in 10 years? What actions are needed for me to get to those places? If new knowledge is required, how do I obtain it? And if new resources are needed, how do I get those? It's basically having a direction and seeing it through, figuring out what resources and actions you need and going out there and going in that direction on, on a day-to-day -day consistent basis. So that's pillar number five, the practice of living purposefully. Pillar number six is the practice of personal integrity. So, Nathaniel Brandon says, if you act against what you perceive as right, if your actions clash with your judgment, you betray your mind. Hypocrisy by its very nature is invalidating. It damages me or damages you as no external rebuke or rejection damages you. So, what does this mean? This basically means, this chapter is all about figuring out your values, figuring out what you think is important, kind of like your law of what you want to live by. 
So once you've figured out your value system, you then need to act in integrity with those. So let's say one of your values is you see things through to the end. So in fact, the reason I give this example because it's one of the values that I have. When you make a decision on something, you see it through to the end. That's, that's a, a value that you might have in your value system. To live with personal integrity is to make sure that you never betray this value. And each time you betray one of the values that you have, then it's a hit on your self-esteem. That's what you your brand says. So another practical example would be tax returns. Um, let's say one of your values is to tell the truth, be honest. Um, and let's say you're filling in your tax return and you pad out your expense claims so that you pay less tax. So the net result is, yes, you do pay less tax if you don't get caught, but your self-esteem takes a hit because of that, because you're violating the values that you have. So the practice of personal integrity, living with personal integrity, increases your self-esteem. And if you go against your integrity or your value system, then that's going to be a hit on your self-esteem as well. So those are the six pillars. Let me run through them very quickly. Practice uh, pillar number one, the practice of living consciously, paying attention to what's going on around you. Pillar number two, the practice of self-acceptance. If you see problems, issues in your life, accept that they are there. Don't bury your head in the sand. Pillar number three, the practice of self-responsibility. Nobody is coming. You are responsible for everything in your life. And you have to take that responsibility very seriously. Pillar number four, the practice of self-assertiveness. You have to honor your wants, values, and needs. And if those are violated, then you need to speak up. Pillar number five, the practice of living purposefully. Don't just float through life. Have a direction. Figure out where you want to go and figure out how you need, what you need to do to get there and go for it. Pillar number six, the practice of personal integrity. Figure out your values, what you believe in, what you think is important, and live your life by those rules. Those are the six pillars that you need to cultivate self-esteem in your life. So, if you're somebody who has low self-esteem and you're watching this video, um, here's what I think you should do. I think you should read this book first. That's, that's a given. This is um, the most seminal work on self-esteem that there is that's agreed on by a lot of people who are a lot smarter and a lot more experienced in this field than I am. Once you've read this book, you're going to have the knowledge, but then you really need to understand that the work starts after you've read this book. You're not going to read this book and all of a sudden you're going to have high self-esteem. What you really need to do is make a deal with yourself. You need to make a deal with yourself that you're going to integrate these practices into your life for months. We're talking three, six months. Self-esteem isn't something you're going to change like that. It's something that's built up over time. Your low self-esteem has been cultivating in your mind possibly for years, decades. Okay, So you need to try and implement these practices every day for months. And over time, it's going to get easier. That first month, by the way, is going to be the hardest month for you. You're going to be overwhelmed by all the practices. But you can just expect that overwhelm. And if you expect that overwhelm to begin with, then once you hit that wall, you're going to have the tools you need to just bust through and just keep on going. So that's the key thing for you to realize here is that this isn't just like, I read this book and you're going to get a solution. This gives you the framework, but you really have to follow through for months in order to make changes. Obviously, after three, six months, you're going to start to see those changes and then it's going to perpetuate you. It's going to inc increase your investment because you'll see that it's working and then it will become a lot easier to, to keep on making those changes. But the first month is always going to be the hardest. So the book also talks about um, beliefs and actions. So um, there's pages and pages of beliefs that Nathaniel Brandon says that you should have um, because beliefs are what lead to actions and I'm not going to run through those right now but that's very interesting it's worth reading through those uh, he also talks about how to cultivate self-esteem in children and without going into very much detail about this I'm going to run through very quickly how you would cultivate self-esteem in, in children so firstly the importance of touch secondly um, unconditional love so make sure that if your child does something wrong it doesn't feel like you're withdrawing the love from them thirdly acceptance so if your child is expressing thoughts and feelings, you have to make sure that you accept those thoughts and feelings. Don't try and rebuke or argue or lecture your child um, to say that you shouldn't be feeling like that. Um, if you give your child acceptance, then he or she is more likely to accept themselves as they grow up. Respect, 
Okay, so the example given here is if your child spills a drink, don't say things like, oh, you're so sloppy, what's the matter with you? Instead say, oh, you've dropped your, you've dropped your drink, would you mind go getting a paper towel from the kitchen? He says that you should treat your children more like adults. So rather than, you know, if somebody comes around your house, an adult comes around your house, you wouldn't condemn them, you wouldn't call them sloppy. You would treat them with respect. You need to do the same thing with your child. Uh, visibility. Your child has a desire to be seen and heard, and you need to respond appropriately to the communications that your child is making to you. He also talks about age-appropriate nurturing. He says that giving choice to children can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. If you give too much choice to a child that isn't ready for it, then that can cultivate a lower self-esteem. And if you don't give enough to somebody who is ready for it, then that also can cultivate lower self-esteem. So age-appropriate nurturing. And one of the biggest parts of this chapter, he talks about praise and criticism. So one of the important things to do here is make sure you praise the, the action and not the person. So if your child does something bad, they're not a bad child. You don't assault, um, you don't assault their character. It's not character assassination. It's, it shouldn't be linked to their identity. Like not a bad child, just the action was bad. So uh, a bad example of this, uh, uh, an example of a bad response uh, would be something like, you did a good job, you are a hard worker, uh, you are a good librarian. Basically, when you say you are, you're attaching that to their identity, that's bad. A better way of appraising this child would be, the books are all in order now, it was a difficult job, but you did it, thank you. So there you're praising the action. Tanya Brenner says it's really important that you get that right. Don't, don't associate actions to identities, just praise the action or criticize the action. Uh, the process to follow for criticism and praise is describe the behavior, describe your feelings about it, describe what you want done, and omit all character assassination. So that's a very brief overview of how to cultivate self-esteem in children. He also talks about cultivating self-esteem in schools, which is worth a read too, but I won't go into any details about that now in this video. So in conclusion, this book took me about three weeks to get through, honestly. I have so much information here, I had to take so many notes, and shooting this video as well has taken me four or five attempts because there's so much stuff to get through that I couldn't possibly cover it all in this video. So I really recommend just go and get this book and read through it. Treat it like a Bible. Read through it twice or three times. If you really have low self-esteem, just follow through on everything that's said here. I really think it's going to bring you good results. And that's it. This video here is part of my self-development experiment. I'm trying to improve my reading, my reading retention and video presentation skills by reading 140 books and presenting reviews about them on video, like I am now. If you enjoyed this video, I've got plenty more coming. I've only done about 16 or 17 books so far. I've got about another 120 to do. So subscribe to the channel, like this video, and I'll send you more book reviews coming your way.